morning, Endeavour. Morning, Tom. This is Carl, and we see your tips on, and uh, we have we're still working on the execute package. We'll have it up to you shortly. Okay, Carl. Sorry. Um, thanks. We'll look for the uh, tips message. Roger. We see the waves, and we could use some extra light there. Okay, Winston, thank you. Endeavour Houston, the flight director wants to know who Buzz Lightyear is down there.
And we're in the midday. Hi, Dan Barry. Go ahead, Previa. Yes, sorry, uh, we've uh, completed checkout except uh, for the last uh, 15 minutes of battery charge check, and both seats look good. Great news, Dan, and we concur. Yeah, we got a bunch of thumbs up down here, too.
Riz, we're just about to go live to the shuttle Endeavour, where the astronauts are about 250 miles above us, hurtling on the globe at about 17,000 miles an hour. And joining us up there on the flight deck is Commander Brian Duffy. First of all, good morning, Commander, or whatever time of day it is for you. Uh, I'm first of all curious about the evasive maneuver you had to perform to avoid uh, a dead Defense Department satellite. Tell us a little bit about that and how that worked out. Uh, sure, Miles, and, uh, you know, it wasn't any big deal for us. Um, there are a lot of things in orbit uh, in space. We uh, know where they are, and uh, just so happened we were going to get uh, close enough to one to just make the uh, folks on the ground say if we just made a small maneuver, we could avoid it completely and make it no problem. So but we did that. It was no big deal. I'm curious. Were you able to see anything at all from the orbiter? Were you able to see that dead satellite, or were you too far away? Well, actually, by the time uh, we did the maneuver early enough so that we were so far away from it, uh, I don't think we could have seen it. The U.S. Space Command in Colorado Springs, Colorado, tracks some 7,000 man-made objects up there that are either dead or active satellites. Especially as you look toward building an international space station, how big a concern is all that space junk? Well, you know, the, I mean, the fact that it's here is certainly um, a concern. Now, quantifying the size of that concern is a, a different story. Um, you know, we're not that worried about it. Um, we think we have very good models and a fairly good understanding of uh, the situation, and um, it's one in which, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with proceeding with building a space station. Uh, you know, we're happy to come fly in the shuttle with all that stuff up here, too. I guess uh, for the folks at home, though, they should understand that even a small fleck of paint can cause some damage to an orbiter when you consider the speeds at which the two objects meet. Oh, that's, that's true, and that's just uh, because of the physics of the situation. You know, it's uh, one half the mass times the velocity squared as the kinetic energy involved, and if you have uh, vehicles and uh, objects going very quickly, um, yeah, you have, it could be a concern. All right, I want to shift gears here a little bit, and I'll open this up to anybody who'd like to take this. Um, during the launch uh, just the other day, uh, one couldn't help but think a little bit about the Challenger, Challenger disaster, which occurred 10 years ago this month. Uh, the temperature was kind of uh, chilly at the Cape, and uh, a lot of the parameters for launching uh, under those circumstances were developed after the Challenger accident. How much was Challenger on people's minds uh, that morning? Well, Miles, I'll take that one. Um, the reason I'll, I'll do that is because I'm the only member on the crew uh, that was uh, in the astronaut office at the time the Challenger occurred. And, um, and we're very aware, of course, of the 10th anniversary of Challenger. Um, it's hard not to not to be. They were our friends, um, our good friends, and our you know companions. Um, we think we're carrying on. We know we're carrying on uh, exactly what they set out to do. We know they'd be very proud of us. Um, we weren't worried about it that morning, uh, but it's the fact that the 10th anniversary is coming up, uh, the Challenger has been on our minds. So. I'm curious, how much on a day-to-day -day basis uh, within NASA does the Challenger accident loom in discussions, decisions, planning? Um, well, Miles, you know, the uh, a after uh, Challenger occurred, uh, we took a very uh, tough look at the agency and the dis way decisions were made, and we made an awful lot of changes. And the system that we have produced as a result uh, of the changes that we made uh, is very good. You can look at our, our track record uh, here. We've done an excellent uh, job, and uh, we're all very confident in the system, and uh, we think it will continue to launch vehicles safely. Are you satisfied, uh, and that could go for all of you here, are you satisfied with uh, the pace of um, development on a next generation of uh, manned spacecraft, a, a single stage to orbit craft, for example, or would you have predicted perhaps 10 years ago that we would have been a little further along? No one wants to take that one. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think we're all very happy flying the shuttle. Uh, it's, it, ha it was designed many years ago. But this is the 74th mission, and it's proved to be very reliable. We've learned more and more on each mission uh, about the vehicle itself, and that data are going to be used to design the next generation spacecraft. There are uh, some efforts underway, although not full-blown for a replacement for the shuttle, but of uh, other manned vehicles being looked at, and uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that we'll go ahead and 
for John when the shuttle gets old enough that, uh, that we will want a, another vehicle. I know recently NASA Administrator uh, Daniel Golden was actually critical of the pace of new rocket development within NASA. There really hasn't been a ground-up uh, new rocket developed uh, in the U.S. Uh, recently. Uh, would you be among those that would call for such uh, efforts, especially in light of the budget constraints in Washington? Well, I think, uh, I think a new vehicle would be a good thing. I think we ought to start planning for a new vehicle. We don't need one right now. The space shuttle has been doing fine, uh, even though a lot of the technology is what you would call by today's standards old. Um, it's proven to be a very reliable, reliable vehicle again, and we have no need to immediately replace it, but I think we ought to start looking at, um, at, at a new vehicle. By the way, for our viewers, that's Mission Specialist uh, Leroy Chow. And let me uh, shift into the spacewalks which are planned here. I know you will be involved in uh, two of the spacewalks. There are two, each of them six and a half hours long. Uh, the object is to uh, look at tools, techniques, and equipment which might be used to build the International Space Station. Um, I, you almost get the sense that uh, NASA is doing its best to get as much spacewalking experience in it as possible uh, so that you have an experienced group of um, astro construction workers when it comes time to build that space station. Is that what's going on? Well, that's certainly part of it, Miles. Uh, you know, we'd like to get some folks experience so that we can have that experience to draw upon when we do good in the full swing of uh, station assembly. Uh, Winston Scott behind me, he's, uh, he's going to do the second EVA with me, and Dan Barry, who's working on the mid-deck right now, will do the first one with me, and that'll be three new uh, EVA people on this flight uh, that have, get some experience. But uh, along with that, we're also, as you mentioned, looking at the design concepts, building concepts, and maintenance concepts for the space station. This is very critical. The, uh, the results that we get from these flight tests are going to feed directly right back into the space station program to make sure, you know, and they'll tweak what they have to tweak to make sure that we get a buildable and a, and a reliable station. Not long ago, there was some talk that the Russians were uh, attempting to modify plans for the International Space Station. They were suggesting that perhaps uh, their current space station, the Mir, become uh, a core feature in the new International Space Station. That would presumably delay things and raise costs on this end. I assume at this point astronauts would prefer that the design stay as it is? Well, Miles, I guess I'm going to try to avoid that question a little bit. Um, you got to remember, we've been training for a year for this flight, and um, especially the last couple of months, uh, we, we've been very focused on our mission, and uh, although we've uh, sort of been aware of what's been going on around our mission, um, we, we probably haven't paid as much attention to it as uh, you might think. So I think we'll just kind of uh, maybe dodge that one a little bit, and uh, maybe it's more appropriate for somebody in our management. Pilot uh, Brent Jett uh, showing that astronauts are good at all kinds of evasive maneuvers. Um, let's move over to uh, Winston Scott. I know when you're on your spacewalk, you're going to uh, spend a little bit of time in the shade of the shuttle. Uh, 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit are the projected temperatures, and I suppose folks in the Northeast concerned about a blizzard should think about that for a moment. Tell me about the thermal modifications on this spacesuit. Are you uh, satisfied that you're going to be nice and toasty up there? You know, Miles, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm very confident that I'm going to be nice and toasty. Uh, the modifications have been worn before. They've looked at uh, how the other guys felt when they wore them a couple of uh, missions before me. They made improvements, and I'm uh, really not that concerned about it. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. But you're a Florida boy. Yes, indeed. But they've got uh, uh, a couple of modifications. As a matter of fact, I've got heated gloves. We just finished our uh, EMU checkout, our extra vehicular mobility unit checkout. I power those gloves up. They got nice and warm for me. I've got what's called an LCDG pot bypass unit that's supposed to keep my uh, torso warm. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be exciting. Besides, I think it's starting to get too cold up there. I can give these guys the signal, and they'll rotate me towards the sun and uh, maybe send me a cup of hot chocolate out there. But I think I'll be okay. I suppose if you bang on the door or window, they'll let you in? I sure hope so. They owe me something. I didn't bring my trumpet up here with me. <laughs> Winston Jett is also a big band uh, orchestral uh, trumpet player. Uh, that would be interesting to try that in the space shuttle. I, I'd like to see and hear how that would sound. Tell me I think bit. it'd be a lot of fun. Of course, that's been done many times before. People, uh, I think, don't realize how many astronauts are also musicians. I happen to be probably the 
only one with a degree in music, but we got a lot of folks around the office that play music and uh, sing and have a good time. And I certainly would not be the first to bring an instrument up and, and play. By the way, for our viewers, that uh, uh, to translate a little bit of NASA jargon there, that bypass he was talking about allows the astronauts simply to turn off the cooling unit in the spacesuit. Now, that sounds like a simple idea. Why didn't they ever do that before? Well, Miles, uh, it's a difficult question for me to answer being a new guy, but I suspect they probably never needed, needed to uh, have that before. We're looking at uh, going to colder and colder temperatures as we get into uh, a larger international space program and we start constructing stations and all. We'll be seeing colder temperatures, and therefore we need these improvements to the suits. All right, not pictured here are 66 Astro Rats. Um, I'm surprised they didn't come and join you for the interview. We were hoping at least one of them would. Tell us a little bit about that experiment. I understand you're testing out some uh, high-tech rat cages. Why is that important? Well, Miles, on this flight, we're, uh, we're flying the animal enclosure units to, to test them out, really. It's a flight test for the enclosure unit. There's uh, no specific experiment with the net rats right now, except to see that if they like their new house. And right now, from what we've seen, um, they're getting along just fine. Uh, you, you, you'd really be surprised. They're doing great. I guess that's uh, particularly important as uh, NASA looks toward that International Space Station. I assume there'll be some long-term rodent residents of that space station, right? Well, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a place for them. And, uh, and even closer than that, down the, down the uh, line, we're going to have some, some uh, life science and space lab missions in which uh, we'll probably be using that, those same enclosures. All right. Thanks so much to uh, those four members of the crew of Endeavor. We appreciate you joining us at whatever time it is for you in York, the course of your day up there. And uh, the, uh, the mission of Endeavor will continue until January 20th. A night landing is planned at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now back to you, Riz. Same. I've got the pre-sleep stuff for you, page 3-2 of the Orbit Ops. When you're ready, no rush. <laughs> 